people, deluded, I'm back again. Special guest settings, he's part of the furniture here. He's always on my channel and I'm always over on his. Tom, how you doing, man? Good morning to you and everyone tuned in, man. Can't hear you, man. I'm on mute, that's what. I'll tell you what, mate, I've had the worst morning <laughs> in the world today. Like, I did my AM show and messed it all up. I had the wrong microphone selected. I've jumped on with you. I had microphones not selected. And now I'm on mute. Like, it couldn't have gone any worse for me today. It really couldn't. <laughs> As long as we can smile about it at the end, man. Yeah, again, disclaimer for those who don't know. Obviously, as we was recording, we had some technical issues on both our ends, actually. Like, my computer restarted, yours restarted. So we're here now, man. I wanted to ask you, before we get into Arsenal Man City, obviously, you're a journalist. What is it like during the international period? Like, for anyone that might want to be a journalist or anything, because obviously, Arsenal's season is jam-packed. And I won't say it's been a quiet period, but it kind of is. What is it like in a, in a period like this? Dull. Uh, <laughs> really, really dull. Um, to be fair, I did cover my first England game this weekend. I went to Wembley to cover the England Brazil game, and um, yeah, that's the first time I've covered England. But I mean, this England team at the moment is 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 amazingly, you know, full of quality, but sadly managed pretty poorly, in my opinion. I I just think that we're wasting a golden generation, to be honest. And yeah, I think the performances have, have certainly shown that the record we've got against nations in the top ten uh, around the world is is deplorable, um, and it doesn't Fact. set us up very well against what we're expecting in the summer in the in the European Championship. So yeah, but otherwise, you know, you're you're kind of searching for content. There's a lot of opinion pieces to write because um, you've got time to reflect and think about what's happened this season, what's coming up. So there's a lot of that, and then. A lot of injury focus as well, because obviously teams playing, nations playing, our players yeah. getting through it unscathed. And in the case of Man City, not really. In the case of Arsenal, we've had a few issues as well. So, yeah, it's, it's still though, it's it's pretty dull. <laughs> 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 I mean, it ain't going to be dull for you much longer, man. You've seen the fixture calendar list is jam packed. Just based off you mentioned in England, I've got a couple of talking points. What do you make of Benjamin White? Well, better yet, Gareth Southgate's latest comments about Benjamin White. 100% you've seen it. He's extended the olive branch, allegedly. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're, they're quite similar, I guess, to the comments he made before the international break. He said the doors, you know, open and that he, he would have included him in this squad. I, I just think that the whole situation has been handled pretty poorly, um, to be honest, from from his side. I think that Fact. he come out and and basically outed Ben White in some ways. Like I think Bring he deflected much. the question um, pretty comfortably. Just said like this isn't the right time to talk about it at the moment. You know, there's he could have still said the doors open to Ben, but now's not the right time to to discuss that. He obviously brought up the Steve Holland thing hours later. The Athletic did a story which revealed that. It, in fact, that turned out not necessarily to be too accurate. So now yeah. it's left more questions about the validity of, of Southgate's answer to that question regarding Steve Holland. So, yeah, I, I think the whole situation is a bit of a mess. And I respect Ben White's silence throughout the entirety of it. You know, he's not done any media. He's not done any comments. He's not put any posts up on social media. Um, and I'd be intrigued when he, and if he has to do any media between now and the end of the season, if he's asked about that situation. Um but I, I just think it's been a horribly handled thing and the latest comments don't really change that, to be fair. I think you're bang on the money, man. And I think it's a shame because, as you said, we've kind of, quote unquote, got a, a, a golden generation where England are concerned. As much as I like Benjamin White, I wouldn't extend that necessarily to, you know, the Bellinghams and, and Maynos and things like mm. that. But definitely with an exciting squad, he should be there, especially if there's question marks about the general fitness of the Trents and the Reese Jameses. And, you know, a weak area of Arsenal, of England, sorry, has to be centre uh, center defence. I wanted to ask you on the topic of England as well. Two, two questions. Obviously, you've seen the language, you know, when our players pull out of international duty versus others, the language is very different. And also on that, what did you make of Declan Rice captain in the nation and getting his 50th cap? I mean, massive congratulations to Declan, of course. It's a brilliant achievement, but I was, I have to say, I was disheartened when I saw it go up because I just knew it meant that he was going to play another full 90 minutes. So, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I was I was really pleased for him. It's a brilliant achievement. I, I wish it had been done in the first game, you know, and given in the the, the armband there. But um, it just felt needless. So so many decisions that Southgate makes just feel so needless. Like you've got two friendlies and you use Pickford in both games. You got Aaron yeah, yeah. sit on the bench, Trafford's on the bench. You know, 
if you want it like Spain, for instance, used all three of their goalkeepers in their two fixtures. They used Unai Simon in a 3 3 game against Brazil, and they used Romero and Rea in the first game against Colombia. And they used all three to give them the opportunity to get minutes to be able to get a look at them before the championships. What has Southgate learned that he didn't already know about Pickford? Nothing. You know, he's talked about play and lack of minutes. Okay, fair enough. But then you've called him up. So you've called him up for a reason. So use him, and then you can get a better idea if indeed Ramsdale is an option that you could use during the tournament. Because say Rea was to get injured for Spain, and then Ramsdale has to play the rest of the games this season, you've not had an opportunity to use Ramsdale in your your lineup to give him that chance. So again, fact, I poor management from from Southgate again on that end, and and bad decision making. But yeah, again, back to Rice. You know, congratulations to him. But frustrating, he's played two full games in the space of a week. Does that concern you? Because obviously these lot of professional footballers, they have to play games. I think every footballer offers their their thoughts on, you know, the fixture calendar list and glorified pointless friendlies. Does it concern you with the amount of football being played? I think Kirill played 120 minutes. To be fair, Zinchenko's had a knock, but he's come off the bench and yeah. Saka's pulled out and whatnot. So that, does it concern you generally? It's always the question, is it? Did, is there too many minutes being played by footballers? Um I don't I I don't know if if it is exactly like the worst thing in the world necessarily um but at the same time you obviously see player injuries on the up we see fatigue continually brought up and you think about this period of games why are we playing friendlies now I know there's qualifiers you know and, and things like that but at the same time you could just restructure the tournament so you don't need the qualifiers and you just qualify straight through the group system. That would and be then good. you can just remove this this need. Then you can put a friendly or two before the tournament starts if you want to have a couple of games. It just it feels like games for the sake of games rather than what's Fact. best for the players. I think you're bang on the money. I think arguably, you know, I know many people say footballers earn a lot of money. They're living their dream. Obviously, with what some people's reality, not just in this country, but world football, uh, in the world, sorry, are facing financially. It seems like mm. footballers live in a bubble. But I do think they're guinea pigs. I do think there's a lot of pointless friendlies and there's a risk of injuries. And I can't blame players if they're cynically pulling out, whether that's Arsenal or City in line with fighting for a league title, whether that's just players looking after themselves off the back of a heavy fixture calendar list. And you look at the last two, three years, We've had a World Cup. We've had all these sort of things. Players are never going to get rest. If you're a footballer of a certain standard, you're probably looking at about, I'd say conservative, about 70 games for club and country, which is quite ridiculous. And as you know yourself, a lot of players, especially this time of year, they are carrying little knocks. On the topic of injuries, you know, going into the Man City Arsenal game, as we move this conversation on, Gabriel, big Gabriel, Gabriel Martinelli, Saka, they, they've got knocks. Does that concern you? Do you think you'll play? Do, do you think they'll play? Do you think there's a bit of gamesmanship? What's your thoughts in relation to that? Uh, there are genuine precautions being taken for those players. It's not a case of Arsenal being tactical, to my understanding. Um, but, you know, all three are within are in contention. We'll hear from Arteta tomorrow in his, his press conference about where they're all at, or we won't, because he doesn't tend to like to to, to give too much out yeah, about players. Anger, yeah. And why would you? You know, I, I tried to chase things up, you know, with, with the club on a couple of things. And it's a case of like, you know, we're, we're not really going to give out, you know, specifics on on players because why would we doesn't help sense. Man City? You know, why would we want to give them all the information that we can give them? And you've got to be like, you know, fair enough. You know, you, we got to ask the questions we ask because that's our job. But at the same time, you have to respect if you're, you're not given an answer because... They want to keep things as as, as under wraps as they can. Exactly. And Man City, they're doing the same, you know, with their players. They're trying to keep things under wrap. We're hearing things about Walker and Stones, etc. We still don't really know 100% either way. And again, I, I doubt we will even when Guardiola talks about it in his press conference. Yep. But yeah, all three are in contention um, to what I know. But um, whether or not they make the starting eleven, whether or not they're able to, to get in the squad or, at all, whether or not they're on the bench remains to be seen. Of the three, which one kind of concerns you the most going into the game? Because for me, it'd probably be, be Martinelli. I think Saka and Big Gabriel will be all right. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I think it's Gabriel for me because if you look at Arsenal's win rate when Gabriel and Saliba start together, it's something like 70 plus percent. And it's when ridiculous. they don't start together, it drops to something like 50 something percent. So, I, you know, we started the game against Man City early in the season with a front three of Nketiah, Jesus and Trossard and won. So there is an argument. That, and I absolutely empathise with your view. I think Martinelli is really important, especially if they don't have Walker on that side. I think he could cause chaos. But 
I, I like the, having that defensive foundation to be able to build from and know that we've got other attacking options that we can use. We've got Havertz now, obviously, in really good form that can play in that centre forward position. Yep. You could start with Trossard, who, despite not always having the best game when he starts, if you get him in the box with the balls, we saw against Porto, despite not having the best of games, he's probably our best you finisher at the club. Happen. So, and then you've got Jesus, who, who is now fit. You know, he's been playing uh, and training all, all the last couple of weeks and he's, he's ready to start games if we need him to. So, we have options. Um, but obviously, I, I, I pray that all three are, are ready and that we can have them for the game. I'm with, I'm with you in that regard. Obviously, we hope we've got our strongest team out there. Football's a funny game. When you look at, I wouldn't necessarily say their results of the season, depending on what people view as that. But when we beat Manchester City and Liverpool, we didn't do it with on paper what would be a lot of Arsenal fans' strongest squad. So we're going to need to stand up to be counted. Where I say Martinelli is, because I know Gabriel's been carried or not, but I just think he'll be there. He's quite durable. He's a beast of a player. I mean, it's going to take a lot for Bukayo Saka not to be there. I just think, because Martinelli's been the kind of longest in Injury I've heard about or I've seen. That's where I'm a bit nervous, really and truly. But I definitely, if I had to pick all three, unfortunately, Saka wasn't there. You know, Martinelli's got a knock. I agree with what you're saying. And you're kind of converting me in that. No, Gabriel with Saliba and with Haaland, etc. It does make me a bit nervous. Mm. On the topic of this game, yeah, how much do you think of a statement it is, whether we win, lose or draw, specifically winning, if I'm honest with you? You know, is it a thing where we can puff out our chest and say we can really believe that while it isn't done, we can win the league title because surely doing the double over them would be great. And I think, what, they've won 13 of the last 14 or something like that at the yeah. Etihad? I'm not sure. But yeah, what would you make of that? Yeah, I, I, it's a weird one because I think obviously like winning the game is a huge boost to us. But I also think it then puts the pressure on Arsenal to win the league. You know, yeah. from that perspective, if Arsenal weren't to win the league after beating City twice, beating Liverpool and then drawing at Anfield, you'd look at that and go well, they must have dropped points in games that they shouldn't have dropped points in if they didn't yep. win it. Um, and with nine games to go, we might have the toughest run in. But I, know I was talking to some of my listeners this morning about this, and I think there's some divide because we people don't want to pile the pressure on. People don't like the expectation rising. But it, I think it would be unfair from kind of a commentator standpoint to not say if Arsenal win this game, they probably should be, you know, they'd be very disappointed then if they didn't win the league yep. at that point. Um, I think we can, with the Liverpool and City game being a draw, afford to draw this game. I think it's a case of just must not lose rather than absolutely must win. Um, right. Whereas if Liverpool or City had won, I would have said it's a must win rather than a must not lose. So that game was really important for, for this one. And if we were to lose this game, I don't think it would necessarily be a massive surprise. I think it would be seen as a big missed opportunity for yeah. Arsenal. Um, but I still don't think necessarily you look at both teams and you think, yeah, Arsenal are on a level with City. I still think City are, with all the resources they've got, the players, they've got. we're talking about the injuries that they've got with no Walker, no Stones, um, potentially no Edison, potentially no De Bruyne, who knows, we'll have to wait and see. I think he's been training this week. Um, you know, they've still got Akanji, Diaz, Ake, Gvardio, who cost them 100 million euros this summer. You know, they've got Bernardo Silva and Grealish back in the team from his injury. Haaland's still fit. Alvarez is still fit. Oscar Bob's had a brilliant international break and looking a fantastic talent as well. You know, you've got Kovacic in the middle. You've got Rodri, who's unbeaten in 61 games, which is a joke. Like, well, I was nervous already, mate. <laughs> exactly. So, even with all those players as question marks, that shows you that the Titan that Arsenal are going up against and still certainly are, for me, the strong favourites for this game. But if Arsenal were to win it, I think that does flip the script significantly for the last nine games. I do think you're bang on the money there. I think where it comes to the fans and the talking points, at the end of the day, the table doesn't lie. I always say, Arsenal fans, we dreamed of kind of being in this realm or moving into this realm. So you have to deal with the talking points. Now, fortunately for the club, when we was in darker times than now, I don't think they've, as much as they can, because they're human, I don't think they've ever let external voices kind of play a part. They just know what the, the task at hand is and they know what they stand to win or lose or draw. As they say, if you can't win, don't lose. I'd love to end our hoodoo at the Etihad. I'd love to do the double over City. I'd love to be, you know, on my channel. I'm sure you'll do the same. Not quite proclaiming we're going to win the league, but a lot more bullish and starting mm -hmm. to believe. And in many ways, I, I don't want to compare it to war, but it does feel like going to war. It's like the new kids on the block versus the veterans. It's, it's the uh, apprentice of such an Arteta against Pep Guardiola. They, we got one over them. In fact, two over them. We've done them at Wembley, done them at the Emirates. To do them three times would be crazy. While I don't want to look beyond Bayern Munich, if you do go through and they deal with Real Madrid, we've got another two 
few games against them. And I don't know how long Pep Guardiola is going to be at Manchester City, but this is the realm we want to be in consistent battles. And I want to move into that ground where we're not necessarily shocked if we beat if we beat if we beat Man City. So, so it should be interesting. On the topic of that, while I haven't got it to hand, a lot of people say you know we've got one of the best top six records against the bigger teams this season. In contrast, City haven't done any haven't done too well. How do you feel about that? And does that give you an even bit more of added confidence, or is it something that can't really be read into going into it? No, I, it's, it's difficult to read too much into it. Always, yeah. you know, there's there's so many uncertainties. Um, I look at this game and I just think, as I say, whatever team City put out is going to be a massive challenge. Whoever yeah. is available for us, we've got the ability to do something, and that creates uh, a game where anything, as I say, can happen. Um, I think it's a game. It's interesting to talk about it in the sense of like who has the pressure on them in this game. Because you could say that Arsenal had the pressure on them because they're league leaders, and if they lose it, they go behind. They go probably down to third. Um, you could say the pressure's on City because if they don't win it, they're probably not out of the race. But you know, it's it's far more of a must win than it is for us. I think from a City perspective, true. So it's it's a really hard game to look at, and it's it's particularly difficult because for the first time in. I can't remember how long. It's a three-horse race for the Premier League title. Never has there been this close of a race for three teams this Crazy, spot, it? close to the end of the season. You know, one point separating all three of them. I'm trying to think of the last time that was the case, and I'm really struggling. Um, oh, so, yeah, it, you can, we can talk about who's available, who's not available, who's going to be there for City, who's not going to be there for City. Um But ultimately, and for us, of course, as well. But it, it's such a hard game to call no matter what is, is the case. I mean, you said it there, so I'm going to ask you: Who do you think the pressure's on, Arsenal or City? Because uh, I think I think us, you know. Yeah, I, I think you'd have to say us because it's our first real chance in a. I know since we'd say since last season, but last season we didn't have the resources that we have this season. We didn't don't have the Dexter momentum Rice. that we have this season. Even though we scored more goals than we've ever scored in the Premier League last season, I think we're on to potentially break that again this season after the goals we've been putting in in 2024. Um, and because of the players that could be out for them as well, you could argue that that, that raises the stakes again for Arsenal. So, yeah, I guess I and from you know coming from an Arsenal perspective as well, I think that naturally makes you lean towards that too. I think it's going to be interesting, but as I said earlier, man, and and you've definitely said it as well. It's like this is the scenarios and the dynamics we wanted at play. This is the realms we wanted to be, and we've definitely come a long way. Obviously, you're not Mikel Arteta and me and you would be here all day trying to guess what Mikel Arteta is thinking in relation to City. On many ways, people say the team's pick itself, especially with the form we're in. But do you think Arteta is tempted to make any changes or could make any changes? Um, I, From that Porto game, I guess the only one really is Martinelli if he's fit, you know, coming in for Trossard. Other than that, I don't see Partey coming in. Um, I don't see Tommy Asu coming in. Uh, I don't see Zinchenko Same. coming in. Um, and if you'd have said to me at the start of the season, you know, Arsenal got their biggest game and the only defender that's not available for you is Timber, who's your left back? I would have said, oh, probably Zinchenko. I would have, and then it's crazy. he said, no, it's going to be Kivio. I'd have been like, sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the hell of a turnaround yeah. for that kid, you know, because he's been, you know, not, he's not been bad at all, but he's just been... He's really caught up leaps and bounds. On the fringe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's, he's come up leaps and bounds and, and really proved... I don't know if he's necessarily proved some. I think he's proved some people wrong because I remember sitting in January seeing Lino Souza leave for Villa and people saying, "Why are we letting him leave? Can't we just swap him out for Kivio?" And now you look at that view. Now and look, think, yeah. well, that was silly, you know. So you know, I think it's a props to props to Kivio, but yeah, he has to start. I think because he offers you a bit of more foundation. Ben White's been fantastic. Ray is obviously going to start this game, and I think you know we need a player of that caliber to help with the being kind of like a fifth defender for us in some ways. And Jorginho has to play because he's just has his experience, play. his form's been excellent, and there's no reason why he shouldn't. So yeah, Rice, Jorginho, Odegaard picks itself. It's just then about the front three and, and who's available. I'm I'm with you with that. I think especially when it's the bigger games, the more kind of chess matches, as I said on your platform, I think Jorginho's my kind of man. Declan Rice speaks for itself. The whole team speaks about it, speaks for itself, really, especially Kirill. Like, like what you said there, if you told me Kirill would be playing in a must-win title chase inside against City at the Etihad, I'd say, oh, uh, it's not that I'm not confident in you. I'll support you, but I'd rather have a Tommy Yasu or a Tim Borian. I wouldn't quite say Zinchenko, but maybe even Zinchenko. In fact, yeah, I would mm. say Zinchenko for all the cons to his game all the pros he could give you mm. so shout out to Kirill I 
I think Havertz has to play, I, but I do think the only change could potentially be Gabriel Jesus, especially because of Martinelli's form. And I wonder if Mikel Arteta is tempted to throw Gabriel Jesus in there. It's against his old team. Obviously, mm. he's been on the bench. I just don't know, man. But as I said, these are the good problems we wanted, man. How do you feel about the running then? Because on paper, we've got 12 games left. Every game's a cup final, as everybody connected to Arsenal says. Yeah, how do you feel about it, man? Arteta has even said we've got one of the finished squads. Players are coming back fit. We're going to need to get it, get it done, really. Yeah, I mean, it's a tough running. You know, you've got a game every, you've got a game every three or four days for the next crazy. six weeks, you know, uh, especially if we beat Bayern and go through to the semi-finals of the, the Champions League, then, then we do. We've got this game against Chelsea that's been rearranged as we expected between Wolves and, and Spurs, which obviously creates a, a different dynamic for us. And before that North London derby, Spurs are going to think and have something like 14 or 15 days off. Ridiculous, before, isn't it? Yeah, and it just seems like, okay, okay great, fantastic. Because I think, you know, it's, it's frustrating, but there could be some advantages to that. There could be something about the momentum going into the North London derby that we can build. You know, That's if we true. have a bad result against Bayern Munich, you can respond to that. Whereas if Spurs okay. finish that before before their 14-day break, they have a bad result. They've then got a stew on that, you know, for 14 days before the derby. So, And then the pressure's arguably on Spurs to say, well, Arsenal have played every three days for the last two weeks. You've not Which had a game. Fresh, it's pressures on you to go and, and retake, especially if they're still in that race for the top four as well. So the pressure could be on them. We've got to go to Old Trafford. That's the last game in that run of, of all those games being played potentially with six weeks worth of two games in, in those weeks. And then you've got like Unai Emery coming to, to, to the Emirates as well, Aston Villa. Arsenal are going to want payback for that game at Villa Park. And yep. we've been very good at revenge this season. You've also got to go to Brighton, which I know Brighton haven't been the team that they've been, you know, in the last couple of seasons. Our record there has not been particularly great. I know we won last season on New Year's Eve, I think it was, but still, it's a very difficult place to to go. The and you don't so, want to go to. Yeah, it's it's tough. And Luton Town, you know, is our next league game after City at home in midweek following that Man City game. And say you lose against City, suddenly that Luton game has so much pressure on it because yeah. it's like Arsenal have to respond and have to get a result. So, yeah, and obviously, as I mentioned, the Bayern Munich games being thrown in there as well is is just fantasy stuff but I, i'm looking forward to it i just I, I guess i could throw back to you dg is like do you have faith that arteta is going to be able to do something perhaps where he hasn't done before which is effectively rotate and manage minutes in the squad i think he's gonna have to i don't think he's i don't think he's got a choice because mm. again god forbid but we me and you could wake up tomorrow and there's a long-term injury or somebody's injured as we know as you know as well better than me because you're a journalist very few of these players not just at arsenal but in world football everybody's carrying something whether they're managing through it's another thing and he's gonna have to because i think you know when we've been having our little run where we've been winning games they've been quote unquote spaced out or we've been able to get away or exert not really that much energy and get the results done based on the the teams you've been throwing out there to me there's going to be no such thing so he's he's going to have to and this is why I'm happy to see Tommy Asu and Partey get some minutes against QPR this is where you know essentially someone like Smith Rowe if you start you're playing quote unquote for your future so he's going to have to I, 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 to answer your question Tom I think he has to there's no other choice you have to Gaffer mm. you know when you sat there in August and you looked at your team and Arteta's a smart man you knew you was going to get to this period you're only going to have players that you trust within that team I think the only one that's not going to get rotated in of Obviously, it's probably going to be the keeper, Aaron Ramsdale. But we need to win the games. Arguably, the top six games, we, you know, we haven't lost this season. And hopefully, that's not the case. It's been the games against the smaller teams where we shot ourselves in the foot. So, in many ways, I'm exaggerating a bit. But that looting game could be as important, if not more important, than the City game. Because it's great if you go and beat City. But if you take your foot off the gas, which the gap mm. won't want, then you're obviously in, in, in kind of trouble. So... Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting, it's a very interesting one, if I'm honest with you. Very good thought-provoking question, Tom. But I don't know, <laughs> and it takes me back to what you said about, that you made a point about the North London derby in many ways. When I think of it firsthand, I'm like, oh, you know what, we need a bit of rest. They're going to be fresher. But then there might be complacency. They might have taken their foot off the gas and we mm. might just be ready to go. So it's an interesting one. My last kind of questions for you before I let you get out of here, man. Um, where do you think the game's won and lost against C? which is difficult to predict, but yeah. Yeah, it's a good question though, because obviously there are so many areas of, of contention. I think I looked at the game when they played against Liverpool and it was almost like City had succumbed to the fact that they were going to take a draw. And if they were very lucky, get a yeah. hit on the counter towards the end. It was a case of, 
either Liverpool are going to win this game or it's going to peter out into a draw. And, you know, arguably it, it, they should have had a penalty. And people's views are, are, are different on that. I, I personally think that they probably made the right decision. I'm on, I'm in the minority, I think, in that penalty call. I just think he gets enough on the ball in that moment um, to, to prevent the penalty from being given. But I, I look at that game and think, if Arsenal can be in a position where the game is level going into the last 10 minutes and they're in the ascendancy, you know, I think Arsenal have done very well to get to that point and it probably will be in the midfield where it is won and lost because Rodri's presence wasn't there well, at the yeah. Emirates. And it is going to be here now. Now, if Arsenal can use Jorginho to to kind of conduct the game in some ways, if Rice can outbattle Kovacic or or Nunez or whoever starts alongside Rodri, because I don't think it's going to be Stones. It probably would have been Stones, but this injury has seemingly Touch put down, pay yeah. to that potentially. Uh, and then obviously the other areas is I think Arsenal's left wing because Walker not there, Stones not there, potentially a Kanji not there. Who is going to start in that area? And if it is Martinelli, then Arsenal, I think, have got an edge. If it's Jesus, Arsenal potentially still have an edge. If it's Trossard, okay, there's question marks about when he starts. But again, if you can get him into the right positions, he's lethal. So Fact. it's that left-hand side for us, right-hand side for them could also be big. And it also, it depends on if Saka's fit. Because if Saka's fit, you've got that combination with White, which has been so good for us this season. Basically, there isn't an area, DG. It's everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Can we yeah. want to lost anywhere on that field on Sunday. That's because it's two really good teams Facts. with massive strengths all over the field, but also arguable weaknesses because of the absences they could both have. I think he'll bang on the money. And I think, obviously, we're not Manchester City, but naturally, through Arteta's coaching, there's going to be similarities with Edison versus Raya, with Rodri against Declan Rice, and all over the field. Naturally, I'm going to gravitate towards midfield. Like you said, you know, mm. Rodri's back. And I know going into the game at the Emirates, all the talk was about Kevin De Bruyne, Kevin De Bruyne, and rightly so. He's a quality he's a quality player. But they missed Rodri. They really did miss Rodri just as much as Kevin De Bruyne. So if they're back, that's going to give them a couple of percentages. And as you said, their goal, they can make goals from all over the field a bit like us with David with David Wright this year we've seen it with Edison so it'll be a very very contrasting kind of game if I'm honest many people would say obviously did City haven't been as strong as they have been do you think that this is the best time to quote unquote beat City or play them because as you said you know I remember the Liverpool game there was a point where it looked like Liverpool against some academy boys, if I'm honest with you. It looked like City were succumbing to the pressure and they've obviously had the last-minute winners against Newcastle. Do you think there's ever been a better time and do you think they're as strong as they were last year? Um, I, th I think, obviously, losing Gundogan's been a really big miss. Um, Massive miss. City. I think that he obviously had turned up in so many big games, big moments for them that not having him for games like this is, is really key because it's then it's like... Who do you play next to Rodri for those big matches? Because Kovacic has not been, I don't think, necessarily as good as maybe they thought he would. Nunez, there's a lot of questions about him. Um, you know, they missed out on Rice. You know, that was that was who they wanted to play alongside Rodri. I mean, that would have been Imagine. a game over for the Premier League. Imagine, forget about the league. If it would have been a that. joke if Rice and Rodri were well. playing together. Um but they're not. And I think Arsenal did the best thing for the league, arguably, by by taking Rice away well. from City. Um so that that area of the field, I think, is 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 very very key. I I don't know whether or not Arteta will look to to throw some wild cards in early in terms of his substitutions in the second half. Like and Havertz, I think, has got a really interesting role that we've not necessarily touched upon in this game, which is can he be the chaos factor that Liverpool don't necessarily have? I think they do in some degree. Of Nunez can be a bit of a, a chaos player. Very right there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's tricky to see like how it's how it will end up playing out because there's just so many unknown variables across Facts. the fixture but that that Liverpool game um I think told us that that city you know have their vulnerabilities compared to last season they were so monotonous and mechanical in how they won from when they dropped those points at forest to then winning the league you know they didn't lose a game they won every single game I think in fact so they've not had that same consistency they drew with Chelsea um, they've dropped points to Liverpool and they've looked vulnerable in, in certain, even like, you know, they played like Copenhagen and stuff in the Champions League. Copenhagen yeah. still got in behind and scored, you know, so they can be got at, which is maybe something that they've lost that. I, not, I don't want to use the word invincible because it's such an Arsenal word, but <laughs> Fact. they've lost that perfect feel about them maybe this season. 
I think you're right on the money. I, I don't think it's a it's a post treble hangover of sorts, but naturally after mm. you win in the treble, there's not many highs. What I'm getting based on what you're saying, the only thing I see going through in my mind that as much as it's a tactical battle, it's about belief. And I look back to the game last season when we played them at their place, and I don't necessarily feel we truly believed we could get it done, regardless mm. of the injuries. I do think things are different now, regardless of how it plays out. Before I let you get out of it, I read your article in relation to Arsenal's potential striker targets. What do you make of apparently us looking for a younger profile striker in you know where 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 do you put the likes of Goya Goya Kerez Zerski and them kind of guys man butchered his it's name but tough yeah. one to pronounce isn't it I've been told about three different pronunciations this week um <laughs> I'm, I'm landing on Yokerez apparently the G is is more silent but I don't know if that's you know I'm gonna take your lead man it's Yokerez <laughs> well, we're going for it. it's easier to say I think um I think it's the right move for Arsenal to go down the route of, of a younger profile. People will say like 25 and he turns 26 and June isn't young, but actually it, it is. It's still in the it context is for a of a full position. 25, 26 years of age, you're moving into those prime years, 27, 28, 29. Player ages are ex- player careers are extending well into their thirties. I mean, look at the level Lewandowski's managed to keep up into you know Facts. his mid thirties. Look at Benzema and what he did, you know, in his mid to late thirties as well. We are seeing the extension of these top strikers if they score good goals. It's not an ability you lose just because you get slightly older. Yeah, I like his profile. I like his finishing. I love the fact that he's been able to add kind of a different element of collaboration to his game at Sporting this season. He's got fourteen assists across all competitions, um, and so I think that. That profile is right. If it's not him, then you do start to look at some of the others. I think I listed off a number of others that are, they're not necessarily players yeah. that Arsenal are definitely looking at. They're players that are obviously in that category of top young striker. You know, there's quite a few this season. You've got Victor Boniface, you've got Brian Broby at Ajax, you've got still Victor Ozzyman, you probably throw into that category still as well, although yeah. he's not scored as many this season. Uh, Lois Opender at RB Leipzig, another one, Evan Ilsen at Porto, who of course we face in the Champions League. And Santiago Benjamin Sesco, Benjamin Sesco, run that Benjamin Sesco of course, as well. I know you love him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so there's there's a lot, you know, there's there's a lot. that there's Whilst there's loads of names in that category, there's not what I've described as a Declan Rice of strikers. Out I agree. There. And so it seems so obvious that he was the guy that was going to take Arsenal's midfield to the next level. I don't think there is an equivalent of that in the in the striker market Amen. this summer. I don't even think Ozymen is necessarily that, that, that figure Facts. because I think there's question marks about his season compared to last season and whether or not he could translate that to the Premier League, of course, whereas Rice was already Premier League acclimatized. You, you could know, just so... see how it was going to work for us. Exactly. So I think that if Arsenal sign anyone, it is seen still as something of a project, something of a risk and something in which they will have to mould to their needs over the course of a season. Something similar to what they've done with Havertz, you could argue. I think you're bang on the money, man. And I, and it's so refreshing, And I, not to sound like I want confirmation bias, but it's so refreshing for somebody else to sit there and say, do you know what? I like this striker, that striker in the third, but there isn't one that I can look at as an honest mm. football fan above everything and say, yeah, you are the Messiah. You're the one to aid the problems. I, I couldn't tell you everybody's weaknesses, but whether it's Jokeres, Osman, Zertsky, I think they're all likeable. There's all likeable attributes, especially when you look at their press, half of them, their pressing metrics. But, there isn't one that you think 100% really convinces. So we'll have to see. Before I let you get out of here, Tom, man, first things first, it's been my pleasure doing this and thank you once again. Let people know where they can find you, even though I can't imagine they don't know. Uh, you can find me at the Goon Talk, as always, uh, every morning, bright and early, 8 a.m. when I've got my head screwed on a little bit tighter than today. Apologies for the, <laughs> the muting at the start. I've had a nightmare. It's all good, man. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can find my written work at football.london as well. And uh, yeah, looking forward to, to Sunday's pivotal clash. Exactly. As he said, we're looking forward to the pivotal clash. Hopefully it's victory for Arsenal and defeat for Manchester City. The man told you where you can find him. Make sure you're following, subscribing, all of that good stuff, checking out his written work um, for uh, his media channels and whatnot. Tom, let me let you enjoy your day off because it is actually his day off. So I appreciate him even more for doing this, man. So yeah, man, let us know your thoughts. Like, comment, subscribe. Tom, enjoy your day. Thanks for this once again. Thanks, Peace, man. everybody. Peace. <laughs> Like, I've been giving, like,